When Reverend Jim comes back next week and none of us are here, you can let him know that's because today's gospel, Jesus taught all the things, he healed all the people, and we're good. <laughs> and if you notice, even while covering that much ground, there were 20 verses skipped in the middle of the gospel lesson today from that time when Jesus taught all the things, and then the new paragraph if you were reading along with Reverend Vaughn and then they went and landed in Gennesaret and he began to heal all the people we skip in those 20 verses Jesus feeding 5,000 people walking on water and stealing a storm so you know just a few things are happening in Mark's gospel for us today it gives me pause to stop and scratch my head a little bit honestly anytime I see that little comma in the bulletin that suggests that we're leaving out part of the gospel reading, I wonder, ooh, where's the good stuff? What, what aren't we going to hear? Oftentimes it's boring. Like, we hear the Ten Commandments, and then, Jesus, and then God gives a whole bunch of other commandments to Moses, and so there's like this pause, and then we pick back up with, and Moses brought the commandments to the people. Sometimes it's scary. It's the hard stuff that maybe we need to all go to Sunday school and ask Dr. Amy. I, I feel like I'm a radio show now, by the way, but that's okay. <laughs> the stuff that we need to sit with and wrestle with a little more before it makes sense in our hearts and our minds of how that can be in Holy Scripture. But today, it was just good stories. The story of Jesus feeding people, the story of Jesus stilling a storm, and so, I don't know, I guess we we're trying to save time. For those who show up in the middle of the summer for worship, we want to make sure that we hit all the bases. Jesus teaches things. Jesus heals people. Jesus goes to the other side of the lake a couple of times, actually, back and forth, if you read the whole story. Maybe that's what was going on in the lectionary. I was really tempted to ask Reverend Vaughn to just read the feeding of the 5,000, but I said to her, watch, if we do that next week when Reverend Jim comes back, that's going to be the story, and then I'm going to be in trouble. So we stuck to the lesson, and as I think about it, the only thing that makes sense in my mind, besides sort of as I make light of this idea that we're going to get the Bible in a nutshell in today's gospel text, is the idea that perhaps those who put together the lectionary really wanted us to focus and dwell on what it meant for Jesus to be with these people. Yes, he feeds people. Yes, he performs all these great miracles that we read about in other places throughout Mark's text. But in this reading, we hear and understand what it means for Jesus simply to be. First, his disciples are out with all the other people healing and teaching themselves, and they come back and they're hungry. Themselves, they're hungry and they're tired, and Jesus is hungry and tired. We're told they haven't even had time to get away to get a bite to eat. So they begin to get on this boat to go away to have some time for themselves. But apparently their boat moves fairly slowly because when the people see them get on the boat, they rush around the lake to the other side and beat them there. So that still they don't have time to eat. If they were smart, they should have eaten on the boat, by the way. Um, at least they got a little bit of rest there. Still they don't have time to really eat and rest and recuperate the way that they wanted to. But when Jesus sees the people, Mark tells us that he had compassion. For them. The Greek word in Mark's gospel is esplogomai. It's a fun word to say, esplogomai. Um, what it literally means, it's speaking about the rending of your guts, because the word for guts in Greek is splog something. Um, so Jesus' guts were twisted up when he saw all these people. Now, a lot of times when we read that splogomai word in scripture texts and we translate it into English, we change it to something like Jesus' heart was rent. Because in the ancient world, your guts, your intestines, were that seat of compassion, of emotion, of empathy. The way that we think about hearts as we draw little hearts for Valentine's Day or those sorts of things and talk about what it means to love today. So in the one case, it kind of works. It makes sense. It's, it's translating an analogy, if you will, 
into terms that make sense in our contemporary Western understanding. But still I think there's something lost when we think about Jesus' heart being rent or Jesus having compassion compared to Jesus' guts being all twisted up inside. Yes, it's about love, but it's also about something more than love. Think for a moment, if you can, of the last time that you had that sinking stomach feeling, like your guts were twisting up inside. If you follow the news cycle, perhaps it wasn't all that long. If you think even more closely about family, community, neighbors, friends, you may not need to go back too much further yet. We all know, I think, what it means to have that feeling of your stomach dropping. And not like you're on a roller coaster, but realizing that you may very well be in that place that you don't know how to recover from. Or that the person that you care about may be experiencing something like that. When Jesus got off the boat and saw the crowds who had come around the lake hurrying to meet him on the other side, he had compassion for them. His guts were twisted in a way that he could not begin to think otherwise. That he would do anything but teach and feed and heal and care for these crowds of people who were gathered before him at the shore of the lake. He had compassion for them. I think sometimes in English we get we move too quickly over that term compassion. We just say, well, you know, yeah, I feel bad for you. I care about you. I, I'm showing compassion for you. Sometimes we even get so caught up in wanting to be the good Samaritans, to go and do something kind and loving, to make a difference in the world, that we get so caught up in our actions, like, you know, maybe feeding a few thousand people, that we don't stop to pause in the compassion to ask what it is that is motivating not only our actions, but God's actions for us that enable us to be in this place, to do the things that we do. This morning, as Barbie was coming in for worship, I said to her, tell me something inspiring about the youth diocese mission trip that, they, that she was just recently on. I was hoping I'd be able to pull a really great thing, and I am going to talk about it. I was hoping it was something the kids did with compassion for their neighbors. But Barbie caught me by surprise, and the story she told me was even better. She told me not about how they did the gardening work, and they were out getting their sleeves rolled up and their hands dirty for the sake of those whom they were present and accompanying, although that's important. But she told me about how the youth, were present for one another in various and different ways during that trip. They were at an art museum, and not all the youth from the diocese were into art, but one youth was particularly taken. And there was space and time given so that that child could take the time to view and sketch and be moved by the art that they were experiencing. It was a busy, high-energy action, stay up late, wake up early, everybody talking and singing and enjoying themselves kind of trip. And for some youth, that was a little too stimulating. But there was space given for quiet downtime by those who maybe didn't need it. And by those who could have used some more, there was self-regulating, a moment to breathe and say, all right, let's keep going. That's what compassion really is, I think. It's making space for those with whom we are accompanying, for those amongst whom we are on the journey. Compassion, that experience of your guts rending for somebody else in Hebrew, is compared to the experience of a mother caring for her child in the womb. This sense of protection that you would do anything 
thing to care for, to keep safe this growing child. Maybe caring for a child in your womb isn't the experience that you have, but maybe it is the experience of a husband sitting with his husband in a hospital room as a cancer diagnosis is announced, knowing, even as they hold hands together, that he will be there for him no matter what continues to transpire. Maybe it's the experience, some of you might have noticed my spouse sitting with our daughter Joanna this morning. He also was on a youth trip, but they didn't get back until 5 a.m. this morning. He was planning on sleeping, but Joanna found out that uh, she was going to be sitting by herself in church. And so her father came to sit with her. Maybe compassion If we want to keep following the sense of being tired and overworked and overwhelmed is what it means for a parent of a preschooler who is at the end of their ropes to read just one more bedtime story. Lately, although there are no preschoolers in our house, the teens and preteens have gotten into watching the Disney series Bluey. They're like 20-minute shows in this on-demand, so we can just keep watching them. <laughs> there might be compassion somewhere in that, too, but we're not going to go there. In the show, it strikes me how these parents, they're cattle healer dogs, I don't know, they're some kind of Australian dogs, and these, these parents of these two preschoolers, they have infinite patience. And so not only do they read that second bedtime story, but then when they pull themselves to bed, ready finally to hit the pillow, and Bluey, the little preschool child, calls out because she's having a hard time going to sleep. The mom or the dad goes back and tucks Bluey in again, sits with Bluey, continues to be present, even when it may feel like we have reached our very last breath. Jesus does this in the intervening 20 verses, but I think perhaps the gift that our cut of the scripture text today gives us is a recognition that not only were Jesus' guts moved in that moment to have compassion on the crowds, not only did did he then go on to do some miraculous things for them following that moment, But when he got back in the boat, he didn't sail away to find another quiet place to rest. He didn't leave the next group of people behind because, no, now it really is enough. When Jesus got back in the boat, he went to Gennesaret, where he found crowds of people again coming to him, not just asking for teachings this time, but bringing sick on their mats, wanting to just reach out and touch the fringe of his garments and Scripture doesn't say it, but it's obvious that once again he has compassion on these crowds, on these people, and he remains present with them. Often when I preach, you know that I want to give us a charge out kind of, and now this is what we should do, encouragement. Certainly I encourage you and myself to have compassion But today, the takeaway that I hope that you sit with, as we heard in the epistle text, in the fantastic introduction to the epistle text today, is not so much the charge that we need to have unending action, unending compassion, but rather than when we feel that we are at that last thread, when we look around and we have no idea what is going on in our world, in our families, in our neighborhoods, to trust and believe that God has compassion for us. That God is present in, with, and among us in our communities, in our worship, in the bread and wine that we will soon share, and in whatever small and big acts, whether it's holding the hand of a beloved spouse, 
waking up late or early with a young child, or just bringing a piece of pie to a neighbor who seems dead. However and whenever we show up, God has compassion for us. Not just those of us who are doing things the way we might like to see things done. Not just those of us who are following the laws and the commandments and the rules. But God has compassion for all of God's children. As a parent cares for a young child, helpless and in need. Amen.